All right, here we go. Technical session number two, introduction to computers. In this session, we're going to be get, kind of be giving you a basic overview of different general types of computers, um, different components, the differences between your hardware, your firmware, your software, your um, basic input, output, and both uh, for various components of the computers. As well, we will start diving into general aspects of um, electricity, tools to use to repair computers, and getting into some very basic safety tips along the way when working on computers, especially when you're dealing with electricity. Electricity is very fun and unfortunately unforgiving when you are working with it. So you have to bear that in mind. So for this particular session, the behavior skills and mindsets that you want to try to keep in mind, although we have not gone over uh, adaptability just yet, we will be getting to that one very soon. We also went over growth mindset yesterday. Always, always when working with computers, bear in mind that it is a continual learning process. It is not something that you can move to a certain point and then just stop because that industry is ever evolving and changing and to remain relevant in that industry, you need to change and evolve with it. All right. Basic definition of a computer. In the most very basic terms, it is an electronic device for storing and processing data in accordance with whatever applications or programs or systems you are using at that time. Also, you know, computers can serve very, very specific, unique functions, or they can be very general purpose, like the ones you use at your homes. You know, with that in mind, we're looking at four very general types of computers overall. Where you have the supercomputer, it's uh, generally used by universities, colleges, manufacturers. Some of you may have heard of Big Blue for IBM. Um, these are systems that are still currently being developed over time and they're getting bigger, faster, and smarter as we go. Uh, they're typically considered to be too big for personal use. Um, they would take up you know, an entire house with the size of these computers that we have now, although funnily enough, the personal computers that we have in our home 50 years ago would have taken up an entire warehouse to do half of what our current computers that we have in our house do right now. Uh, then we step down to the next level below that, which is a mainframe. It has tons of storage device, lots of input output capabilities. Can it connect across vast distances, typically used in enterprise settings, Large corporations such, you know, and these are used as your servers. Um, companies can use this to service hundreds of individual users and store all the operating systems on the servers rather than actually having them on the actual PCs people are using them. Um, you see this a lot in retail where you have the point of sale machines that your cashiers use. Those are basically considered thin client computers. They're very stripped down computers. They have a very specific purpose, but the operating systems are run from the servers, not necessarily from the actual computers that they're using. Then you have the um, mini computer. It's faster than a micro, holds more storage and access and stuff like that. This would be um, the central computers that point of sale machines would connect to before they would also connect up to servers and mainframes. Then lastly, we get to the microcomputer, which is the best example is the personal computer that many of us are using today. Um, it has a moderate amount of storage, relatively, you know, strong processors in them, but most importantly, they're affordable for the average user to acquire and use. Um, especially over time, back in the you know late 90s, it cost you a couple grand for just a basic computer to work on. And now at this point, you can get a, you know, a relatively good computer for just a couple hundred dollars. So the price has continued to come down, the power has continued to go up, and 
it has become more widely adopted and used over time. Any questions so far? All right. Basic <clears throat> breakdown of computing parts, very basic terms. So you have three types of components in very general terms. You have hardware, which the easiest way to remember, it's basically almost anything that you can physically touch on a computer. It's going to be your CPU. It's going to be your storage drives. It's going to be your RAM modules, um, power supply, physical pieces that you can actually touch. That is where you would get into hardware, monitors, mice, CPUs, disks, webcams, all that fun stuff, anything you can touch. Soft, excuse me, software. This is the programming instructions on the actual physical hardware so that, or excuse me, programming instructions so the computer can actually use the physical hardware that is attached to it. It's not just you plug it in and it just works. There's a lot of stuff that actually is involved in getting it to that place. Um, it is a lot simpler nowadays rather than, you know, just 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now, most things are essentially PNP or plug and play. You plug it in, there's a general list of drivers so that the system knows how to operate that stuff. It can go out, find the more specific stuff, bring it back, and it makes the user experience a little more seamless. So you don't necessarily need um, a tech whiz to come in and manually do all this stuff for you the way it used to be, unfortunately. Um, and then we get to the final component, which is kind of a midway point is firmware. Now, this is a hardware chip that will have software stored on it. It's a very specific thing. Um, and the two big examples of this is going to be BIOS chip, which we will get into BIOS a little bit later, but that is the basic input output system. And then and then you have the ROM storage which ROM is short for read only memory. So any questions so far, we will get into what BIOS and ROM is a little bit more as we go along, but just in basic terms, these are how we break down these three components. All right, pretty basic examples of hardware are you know all your components your connectors physical ports we have to distinguish that between software ports you will know a little bit more as to what those are as we go throughout this course but your physical ports those would be where you would connect components to the computer on the back of the computer as well as onto your motherboard and things like that <clears throat> um slots this would be where you would install different things like graphics cards, sound cards, network interface cards, things like that physically on the motherboard. Tomorrow we will be going doing a tour through the inside of a computer and we will kind of, you know, give you a good introduction as to the geography of a motherboard, the different types of motherboards there are and the types of components that can attach to them. And then we have peripherals. Peripherals could be anything like webcams, microphones, any of that kind of fun stuff that you would actually hook up to the computer. And um, use to interact with the computer in different ways, MIDI devices for music, you know, various other components you can use. And then uh, we will move right along to firmware. As we were just talking about, this is the software that is stored on a chip that is physically mounted to the motherboard itself. One of the bit, you know, the main components for that would be the BIOS, which stands for Basic Input Output System. Now, when you first turn your computer on, the first thing it communicates with is the BIOS, because the BIOS tells it where to go looking for everything else. Where is the operating system stored? Is it physically on this computer? Is it in a hard drive? Is it on a thumb drive? Is it on a faraway server? How do I connect and find that operating system? Okay, good. I know where I need to go. So once it gets there, also, I have all this stuff connected to me. How do I interact with that stuff? Well, BIOS tells it, okay, you, here are the drivers you would use to interact with these various different things that are hooked up to you so that we can now communicate in a meaningful way. <clears throat> now, 
it is welded onto the motherboard. It is physically attached. So that is a very specific piece. Um, it typically or historically was read only, but now they've actually made it to where um, you can update the memory or do update security peripherals and stuff like that, upgrading your BIOS and stuff like that. That is called flashing the BIOS. Anybody in IT will tell you that is a very stressful time in your life when you are trying to flash the BIOS. Because if anything goes wrong, if there is a signal interruption, if the power goes out, if anything goes wrong, you now are the proud owner of a very expensive paper. That computer will no longer function. Questions so far? All right. Moving along. Software. Broken down into two general groups. You have your operating systems and your applications and programs. Operating system is kind of the overarching system that you'll be using like Mac OS, Windows, Linux, things like that. And you would use this as a way to interface with the hardware and other applications on your system. It kind of manages the communication between you and everything else that is connected. And it will control all the inputs and outputs on your system as well as running any of the applications that you would install for greater productivity on your system. Um, applications, they allow us to perform very useful human tasks or very useless human tasks with regards to gaming and stuff like that, which is purely for entertainment for the most part. But these are things that we would put on top of the operating system, and they are written for specific operating systems. Like you cannot just take a general Mac application and go and run it on Windows and vice versa because the systems won't know how to talk to each other. They have to speak a common language and those operating systems provide the framework for that language so that they can talk to each other. And even many of these operating systems are built onto another underlying architecture like Linux and Mac were typically built on top of a Unix platform. Windows is now moving back to that because of their most popular one, Windows XP in the business world, when it went away, customers haven't really been happy and a lot of them haven't really wanted to upgrade to the more modern versions and still use virtual machines to use the older versions just because it was more stable. So in the, most, in the more recent iterations of Windows, I believe Windows 11, as it's coming out, will be also built on the Unix platform. So examples of applications. Microsoft Office, iWork, video games, things of that nature, any things that kind of operating on top of the, op the operating system to kind of give you greater productivity and or entertainment. Questions so far? All right, go for it, Ms. Diaz. Okay, so when I was reading and it was, um, which is what you just explained, the 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 systems can't run like you can't switch and run the systems on uh, a different device well different um like mac can't run on um how can on windows it? right on windows and vice versa but um is is there any program that's like that or it's just no program is like that, that in general that's, that's the way it is which is why they create different plugins like when you go to a store to download an application like if i wanted to go download uh microsoft office even though i'm on a mac they have a mac version of it so they have a version of that application that has plugins that allow it to communicate with those different operating systems they not every application does it because it's not necessarily beneficial to them. So if like 99% of your customers are on Windows and only 1% is on Mac, and there isn't really a call for people to on the Mac community to want that application, you're not going to really develop that plugin and put in that extra work for maybe 1% more. But you know, things like Office and Excel and things like that. These are very common people, you know, even though they portaled over to Mac, they're so comfortable with that Microsoft Office suite. So it was very beneficial to Microsoft Office to say, hey, let's make a, uh, a Mac plugin 
And then we can expand our market even more because a lot of people use this stuff at their work life. And some people will take the stuff home, but they have MacBooks. And we want to have that cross compatibility. So, you know, let's give them a plug in for it so then they can use it at home. So, does that clear that up? Beautiful. All right. Moving along. Computers do not speak our language. Uh, they don't even, you know, speak anything remotely like what we do. They use a language that basically is called binary. Binary is just kind of like a light switch. It can either be a one or a zero, on or off. That is all computers see in its entirety. So on or off, one or zero. And that is the basic machine language for all computers operate off of this. And it's broken down into various ways that they will measure it to make it a little bit easier for our, us to kind of process it. So we have the bit, which is a single piece and either a one or a zero that is considered a bit. So one unit. Then you move up to the next level, which is the byte, which is a combination of eight ones or zeros. So eight ones or zeros clustered together is considered a byte. And then half of a byte, and this does become relevant later, half of a byte is called a nibble, and that is four bits. So four ones or zeros together. So nibbles become relevant when we start talking about hexadecimals. Now, when you are looking at the, at the essentially the shorthand when they're talking about things where you have the kilobyte here, the big thing to look at is the B. Is the B uppercase or lowercase? If it is uppercase, it is a byte. If it is lowercase, it is a bit. So when you're dealing with measurements, this is where a lot of people tend to trip up, you know, like, you know, I, you know, my internet is, you know, one, gig, one gigabyte per second. Like, wow, that's really fast. And then come to find out, no, it's just one giga, one gigabit per second. So, you know, it's divided by eight. So it does come important when you're measuring things and when you're reading things that you understand that a uppercase B is a byte, lowercase B is a bit. And everything is broken down into ones or zeros. So bit, byte, nibble. Kilobyte is 1,024 bytes. And that is because everything is in clusters of eight. However, in shorthand reference, they will say 1,000 bytes is a kilobyte, just to make it kind of easy because it fits within the metric system dynamic and all that fun stuff. So it's just a little bit easier to wrap your head around then remembering that it is 1024 in every one. Um, so then you get into a megabyte which is 1,024 kilobytes, and then a gigabyte is 1,024 megabytes. So it steps up each time. Now, the language that we break everything down to uh, as far as to what these ones and zeros mean over time uh, was originally designed by the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII. Now, Here's where we got to explain with regards to um, some of the stuff that we are teaching, there will be a divergence for the most part. We will tell you for the exam, you need to know this. However, in reality, things may be a little different because the exam currently is a little over than three years old. And then it took a year for them to develop that exam. So most of the material is about four years old. That's a lifetime in IT. So you will often hear from us say, with regards to the exam, this is the case. However, when you're out in the wild and in real life, it may not be because the ASCII is currently being replaced right now by the UTF-8, which is a more updated standard that allows for more characters. So originally, the ASCII, oops, it helps if I turn off my annotation. 
Um, this gives you the table of basically all the binary and what that translates to in um, language we could understand. So, but it only allowed for 127 characters, which is not a lot. I think now with the UTF-8, trying to remember what the, um, what UTF-8 allows for some huge number with regards to number of characters. Find You're saying F in Frank or S as in Sam? Do what? Are you saying F as in Frank or Yeah, as Union. Yeah, Union, UTF, Thomas, F, Frank. Or UTF. F as in Frank. UTF 8. Okay. And that is, that is a real life um, thing it's versus encoding. A, yeah. Yeah, coding. And it allows for 1,200 and, or 1,252 independent characters versus the 127 that the ASCII will well, allow one, for. Technically 128 because zero is a number. Semantics. Yes, 128. Good morning, everyone. Just trying to give them a hard time. Welcome, Diego. Good day, sir. But anybody, did you guys know that? that the, the computer only knows ones and zeros. Like all the stuff we see is just the, the inner workings of magic and pixie dust. But we'll talk about what it really is. But all it sees is ones and zeros. Like that's pretty significant in itself. I just didn't know anybody came into class not knowing that. So as you turn your computer on and as you were on Zoom, all, computer don't know Zoom, but it knows a series of ones and zeros. That even create. your monitor. What's amazing, even your monitor, it's all zeros and ones. Every all single zero pixel one. that is in there to create the picture, it's either on or off. That's that's pretty significant. This it, When I realized that, it kind of, like, wow. Yeah. And the question that you know inevitably will come up: Do I need to memorize this chart and know how to write in binary for the uh, A plus exam? No, no, you don't. <clears throat> you need to have a basic understanding of how binary works and um, the concepts behind it. You may need to calculate some numbers in binary, um, but when we start getting into things like CIDR subnetting and things like that, you do need to have a pretty solid grasp of binary as well as its replacement, which is hexadecimal um, that's coming up. But we will get into that a little bit later. Once you mess around with it a little bit, it becomes a lot easier to understand. So, but for now, this is basically just an overview letting you know, this is how it's operated. This is the older way how uh, binary was translated into a language that um, was a little more functional. All right. Um, stages of computers. Uh, Marvin, can you grab this one real quick for me, please? Gotcha. So, I'm going to read and we'll talk about it. Data comes in through an input device that is sent to the computer by memory. It's then processed. The, the CPU processes the data based on the input and the program installed on the memory. Additionally, when the computer is finished processing that data, it's presented through an output device as information. Information can be stored in computer memory. So as those points are received by the CPU, this is just a chain of events that, that goes from input to what's happening as information. And that's pretty basic, but it's uh, important to know the processes that happens when, you, when you're inputting information into your computer. Now, um, it's not a, a major point. I wanna go to the next slide. On it, I'm back. You back? He's back, guys. Yay! But it's just the process. Just 
in 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 short, this is what the computer does that you don't see. That we have a couple questions for you to answer. It should pop up if you're if you're locked into our uh, Nearpod. So it's four questions. So work through those really quick. EDRW can do input and output. My first thing to know what DVDRW stands for. True. It is true. What's uh, tell us what the RW stands for? Mark just gave it to us. Read and write. <sighs> Very good. Lastly, DVD ROM drive can do input and output. Both. Very good. What is it? If it's not both, what is it? Input. Input. Very good. Good job. All right. That kind of leads us to our next slide. We're going to unpause the recording here. Oh, nope, we stopped again. So, <clears throat> basic inputs as we know them for the most part. You have keyboard. Mouse, drives, scanners, digital cameras, modems, microphones, NIC. Does anybody know what a NIC is? Half a dime. Okay. It's a half a dime. Half a dime? Yeah, nickel, no? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's I'm true. sorry. Hey, that could be. Uh, all right, I did enough, inter <laughs> enough damage. <laughs> I'm out. Take care. Thank Diego. you, TJ. <laughs> Network <laughs> interface card. Not a monetary unit. So network interface card. That is what a NIC is. Um, these are all input devices. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, my tablet, my screen's an input device. With regards to the exam, if they do not specifically state that the monitor is touchscreen, you must assume it is a regular monitor. So it is an output only device. So with that, we will move to processing devices where you would have your CPU, your RAM, your drives and your motherboard. These are the essentially the brains of the computer, allowing it to process whatever information that we are needing and allowing us to interact. And we have outputs. That's where we go to the monitor, printer, speakers, modem, drives. And that Nick shows up again. So yes, devices can be both, like a touchscreen monitor, that's both. It's an input device and an output device. Now there are specialized pieces of equipment like they do have keyboards for hearing impaired that actually will do a braille output on the keyboard itself. So in that specific instance, that keyboard becomes an input output device that is, that is more of an exception rather than the rule. So, all-in-one printers. They can print, scan, and copy. Then that becomes an input-output device. But a printer solely by itself, <clears throat> single function unit is output only. Scanner solely by itself is an input only. So computers, how they work. Who wants to give some quick examples of input devices just off the top of their head? See how many we can get in a one minute time frame. I got keyboard, keyboard mouse. And then it just paused. 
Microphone. Okay, we got three. Go ahead, Alan. Digital camera. Webcam. Drives. A what? Drives. Drives. Yep, you can use those. Drives. Touch screens. Controllers. Head headphones. Is that an input? It'd be an output. It that would be an output. Very good. Now they do have headphones with microphones on them, and it becomes both, but specifically straight headphones, output only. Scanner. All right, what would you use for processing? CPU, RAM, OS, motherboard, missing one. Drives, there we go, very good. Outputs, how many outputs can we get up there in a minute? Monitor, headphones, modem, speaker. Printer, Nick. USB, USB could be both. But it would be the uh, peripherals attached to it. So yeah, flash drive, that could be both like that. Very good. Microphone would be a input, input only. If you think about it, Ms. Nar, you're speaking into it. It could be what you're saying could be being transcribed to text. So you could be writing, but you're talking. So your your voice is being used as a typewriter. So you're inputting information through your voice. So it's the input device. All right. So. This moment, I'm going to plug along here a little bit. Another quick little quiz for everybody. How many kilobytes are in a megabyte? No fair giving away answers in the chat. It's in the near <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about a lot of electricity. Technically, there are, uh, <laughs> with regards to the quiz, there are 1024 uh, kilobytes in a megabyte. So with regards to dealing with computers, if you are working with computers or any such manner, you are dealing with electricity. So you need to be aware with it, at least on a basic level, how to uh, deal with it and various components. Um, you need to be able to protect yourself as well as the components that you are working on. Because you can either shock yourself or irreparably damage a component in the process. And it is a lot easier to do either of those things than you think. So basic terms with regards to electricity, you need to kind of be aware of. You have a short, which is a sudden increase in the flow of electricity that can uh, rapidly increase temperature and damage components. Um, when alternating current flows into an unintended path because electricity, much like water, uh, tends to follow the path of least resistance. 
So you cannot force it to go in a direction it does not necessarily want to go. It is going to utilize the easiest path to get to ground. And if we touch an electronic component that is hot, we are the easiest path to get to ground. So please bear that in mind when working with electronic components. Now, the other thing you need to be aware of is a volt is a basic unit of measure with regards to the force of electrons moving through a medium, typically a copper wire. In the US, we typically utilize a 110 volt system, although here it shows 115 because it's considered 110 to 115. Um, in our electrical grid, although if you step outside of the US, many other countries operate off of 220. Um, 220 is a lot more dangerous to deal with because 110 shocks, 220 burns. It's just that simple. I mean, it, it hurts if you've ever been hit by 220. It's no fun. Um, a watt, it is, the, it is what is used to measure the power consumption of a device. And typically how you would calculate a watt is a volt times an amp equals a watt. Um, also, we want to be aware of capacitors. Now, if you have ever looked at it, like opened up and looked inside an electronic device, there may be a bunch of things on there that look like batteries, like little tiny batteries that are welded down to uh, circuit boards and stuff like that. That is called a, compa a capacitor. And it holds electricity even after the power has been turned off. So even if you've turned off the power, disconnected it, removed everything, you think it's safe, that is not necessarily the case. Capacitors themselves will store electricity in the device, even though it is unplugged and can still be very dangerous if you ground them out. Um, transformer. This is a device that changes the ratio of voltage to current in a particular device or, you know, on the um, electrical grid itself as well. Any questions so far? These are just basic terms to kind of be aware of with regards to electricity when working in a computer. Yes, Alan. Um, you gave a, um, like what was the, uh, you said volt times what equals, it was when you were going over watts. Watts, like, okay, voltage times amperage. So a volt times an amp equals a watt. So if you have, Two volts, two amps, four watts. So two times two, four. And you won't be tested on how to calculate wattage. It's just something to kind of remember. So again, we need to have a very basic understanding of the workings of electricity, but you know, when dealing with computers, just because we are working with electricity, you don't need to have like an electrician's level of understanding and working with it. All right, protecting yourself from shock. Um, whenever you're working on a computer, anytime you're gonna be opening up that computer, you need to disconnect it from its power source. There are people that go ahead and, uh, you know, and do this stuff without doing it. Again, you know, people don't tip, tend to, you know, people sometimes don't follow all the safety precautions that are in place, but they are in place for a reason. But with regards to the safety for the exam and typically most work environments, you must disconnect a unit from its power source before you open it up. And then you need to press and hold the power button for at least five seconds to discharge all the residual electricity from the uh, capacitors in the unit. Did anybody know that before Kelly just said that? Most people just unplug it and go to work. Yeah. Nobody knew about holding that power button down, right? You, If you have a desktop or you get to a desktop and you have the opportunity to do that, it's pretty neat to see that if you hold that button down, there, if there's a light somewhere, it'll slowly fade away because of that, mm -hmm. that power that's stored up. That's still there just by turning it off. You can hit shut down, it turns off, it still has that residual. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And I was a freaking, um, I was a computer a computer manager over a computer department and I didn't know that. 
So let that let you know how IT experience varies. And so you can't trust everybody, you know. So, but I learned that in the class. But I well. long worked in computers for a while and didn't know that. So <laughs> so yes. So you disconnect the unit from the power source, then you unplug it from the wall, hold down the power button for five seconds to disperse all residual charge in the capacitors. Now, with regards to other units like printers, CRT monitors, and power supplies. Um, printers, this mostly refers to laser printers because they actually have what's called an HVPS or a high voltage power supply. They are very dangerous. Um, power supplies in general, we do not ever crack the case on a power supply, ever. That is something for an electrician to do. Power supplies are very dangerous. They hold tons of capacitors. It is basically a box full of capacitors. And you start poking and prodding around in there, even though that thing has been disconnected from the wall, it can kill you. So they are put in a very tight metal case, never crack that case. They are considered what's called an FRU or field replaceable unit. If it breaks, we just replace it. We don't try to fix it with regards to power supplies. So that's something to always keep in mind. They're relatively inexpensive. It is not worth the risk. So, all right. Types of fire extinguishers. Yes, you do need to know the difference between these. Yes, you will see a question like this on the 1001 and possibly the 1002. So there are three basic classifications of fire extinguishers that you need to worry about. Class A, which is basically a metal can with a pump that has water in it. It's used to put out like wood, paper, and combustibles like that. It is like the lowest level of fire extinguisher you could have on site. Then you get into class B. Um, this is used for putting out things, fire with regards to liquids, um, gasoline, kerosene, oil, stuff like that. It is typically a foam that will spray out. You'll see them in kitchens and restaurants and stuff like that. They will utilize this because it is very effective in putting out uh, oil fires and stuff like that. And then you get into uh, class C, which is a non-conductive chemical powder. And it is used to put out fires with regards to electronics. These tend to be the most common fire extinguishers you will see out there today in almost any setting. Um, if you buy one at Walmart or you know at any store or whatever to use in your house or keep in your house, it's generally gonna be a class C because it kind of covers all the bases. Um, most enterprise environments, offices and stuff like that, they will have class C in there as well. Now, for a while there, they were using another kind of uh, fire extinguisher with regards to electronics. And they use these in the big server farms and stuff like that. And they would use argon. Argon's really great because it's, it basically displaces all the oxygen, puts the fire out instantly, saves a lot of these you know, very expensive machines. Although there is a very, very big drawback. It replaces all the oxygen in the room. So if there is a person in that room, they're not going to be able to breathe. So it not conducive to humans, you know, when they're in a server room, fire breaks out. They were using RN for a while, but they're, you know, didn't work out so good. So now they've switched over to using, utilizing more class C's. And I think they're working on a, another form as well. But for the purposes of the test, they focus predominantly on these three. A, for wood and paper, combustibles. B, liquids like gasoline, kerosene, oil. C, non-conductive uh, chemicals utilized for electronic, electronic fires. Questions so far? All right. Now, 
when handling computer components, this is a term that will come up on a very regular basis, which is ESD, electrostatic discharge. Uh, we were just talking about a couple of minutes ago that electricity can damage components. Well, if any of you have ever walked around, shuffled your feet on the carpet, touched the doorknob, you got that little quick shock from the doorknob. For us to be able to feel that, it has to be a minimum of two to 3,000 volts before we even feel it. That's the lightest shock. I think it has to be up to 10,000 before we actually even see it, before you would see the little zap. So to put that into perspective, you can damage a computer component with as little as 100 volts. You wouldn't even feel it and you could fry a CPU. So we need to take extra precaution whenever we are handling any components inside a computer. And if we're working in a team environment, like if I was gonna go over to hand Marvin a RAM module, if I'm walking across the office and I go to hand him that RAM module, one of the first things I would need to do is reach out and touch Marvin with the hand that is not holding that component because I need to equalize the charge between me and Marvin. So I reach out and I'll touch his arm and then I would hand him the component. That way there is a safe transfer. There's no possibility of the um, unit itself receiving a spark and damaging. So there's two basic types of failure that can happen in this case. There's catastrophic, means it doesn't work at all. And then there's an upset failure where it damages it to a point where it doesn't operate fully. And so it becomes kind of an intermittent problem and those are a little bit higher, harder to diagnose. But for the most part, we need to try to ground ourselves effectively in order to prevent things like this from happening. There are four main ways that we would use for grounding ourselves in order to um, prevent this from happening whenever we're working on with components. One of the most common, the most readily available that you will see is the ever popular ESD bracelet. It kind of just wraps around your wrist. There's a little metal pad that will touch your skin. You need to make sure to secure me on there, not loosely, you know, intermittently touching your arm. And this will, it has a long wire cable on it um, with a clip on the end. And you will clip that to the inside frame of the computer as you're working on it. That way you maintain a neutral charge between you and the unit. And there is no chance of you damaging any components at that point. If somebody's coming over to help you, they need to immediately hook up to that computer before they reach inside it. And it minimizes possibility for damage. People will say, well, you know, I've done it a hundred times. I've never damaged a component. Only takes once, you know, frying a, a hard drive or something like that, that has really, really um, sensitive data on it or irreplaceable data on it. And then you'll sit there and go, man, I wish I had just taken the extra 10 seconds to use an ESD bracelet. Because I will tell you right now, it's, it's bad when you destroy something of your own. Like if you've bricked a computer that's yours, that's bad. You hate it. It's even worse when you do it to somebody else. When you do it to their data and that's your job to fix it. So data is a very important thing. We need to do what we can to protect it. Uh, the next level of ESD protection you can utilize which is called an ESD mat. And it's basically a mat you can stand on or they have ones that the components can sit on. And then there's a cable that comes out of it and grounds as well. Um, so it helps still maintain that neutral charge. Now for transportation and storage of components, you have anti-static bags. These are great, wonderful things. Um, you would store any components in them. They're kind of like funky looking, uh, like a grayish tone <clears throat> Ziploc bag that you kind of keep components in. Even when you remove a component, if you're going to use that component ever again, store it in an anti-static bag. Uh, it will protect that unit from, you know, any ESD damage that could possibly happen. Now, a lot of people sometimes don't like using the bracelets. They don't like the mats. They don't necessarily trust it. Um, so we had somebody in our class 
who wore jewelry because one of the big things before you move into any you know work on any computer you need to remove all of your jewelry they particularly didn't want to do all that so they ended up buying esd gloves that would go around the jewelry preventing any snagging or um, grounding of the jewelry to the components as you're working on them so that is an option as well uh they're also real you know any one of these things are relatively inexpensive to acquire um a lot of times you'll get kits something you know comes in a little bag like this it'll have all of that stuff in there for you and you can get them pretty inexpensively some places will give them out to you for free um questions so far All right. Uh, we kind of went over this a little bit. <clears throat> when you're working with someone else before you hand them a component, make sure to touch them before you hand over the unit, creating a neutral charge between the two of you. Store components, store components, store components in the anti-static bags uh, when not in use or in transport whenever possible. Uh, try not try to work on hard floors. Um, and avoid um, carpeting as much as possible. Uh, that's why you see in most workshops, they do not have carpeting in there at all. They're usually tile, linoleum, or wood flooring, uh, especially in server rooms and things like that. Um, yeah, remove packing tape. Uh, big one is peanuts, like the styrofoam peanuts. Those are real bad about electrostatic discharge. You gotta make sure all that is cleared away before you, you know, uh, work on any units long if you're a person with long hair I particularly don't have this issue but if you do have long hair you need to tie it back so that you don't have hair falling down into the uh, computer as you're working on it um, as that can also be a uh, vector for ESD especially in low humidity environments all right. Kelly, I have the exact same kit, man. What is this one? Same kit. I don't know if y'all can see it. But I have the, I was looking at the picture. I was like, man, why does it look so familiar? <laughs> the same kit, that's, the, that's the standard generation kit. Man. That's the, I guess that's where that picture came from, too. But yeah, uh, that's kind of neat. Um, tools that you'll see in the industry, and we're not saying that you got to get a kit but it's always cool to have what you need to work on PCs at your disposal. But let's let's do this, because I'm interested. You know, a computer has a lot of small screws, right? So if you got like a screwdriver, what would be cool for that screwdriver to have so you don't lose those small screws and whatnot? What would be a, 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 a added incentive? Check that out. Mark said it. Jimmy said it. And um, I'm sorry, Mark. I'm sorry, Jimmy. You do not want it to be magnetic. I know, man. You're, I was about to yeah. say you're leading down. You're leading them down a bad yeah. path. There. I wanted to, I, but I want it because most people would think <clears throat> that that would be cool to have. If you, unless you're working on a car, you know those come with magnetic. So you don't want your um, your any of your uh, PC tools to have that ability. You just got to be super careful with those tools and in hopes you have something like this guy. I don't know if you can see it, but it comes out and it will grab the tip of a screw. You want to have something like that that will grab it. But, you know, they cannot be magnetized, unfortunately, uh, because it, it's not going to jive well with what's going on on the inside. But most people think that that's OK. So I'm glad that we got that out the way. Um, but. Having a good little kit with what you need. This kit has the grounding strap. It has um, all sorts of little smaller keys. And then you got like a chip uh, CPU ex uh, extractor as well. So it's, it's neat to have all of that when you are working in the field. Maybe it'll be supplied by, uh, by your employer, but if not, uh, somebody mentioned uh, super. They're they're not that cost costly to have. Yeah, I got a so. I got a uh, cautionary tale with regards to the chip extractor, real quick. Yeah, um, you need to tell that. 
I, I recall that. You know, okay. that. chip extractor costs less than a dollar. It's probably a 50 cent piece, or something like that. It's a little clip, it's like a little clip with hooks. Um, but a lot of times people are like, you know, it's just faster. I'll just reach in there, grab it with my fingers, and I'll put it back in its little case. Good to go. It's just it's just quicker, you know. I don't have to worry about messing with it, all that fun stuff. Well, in my cohort, when we were physically on site, one of the fun things we did is we built a full gaming computer uh, with VR and all that fun stuff. Like they, they brought in all the components. We built it from scratch. So installing every, every little bit of it and then, you know, got it up and running and stuff like that. And it was really cool for those of us who had never actually gotten the opportunity to do that before. Well, the initial part of the build was being led by the TA at that time. And he got a little bit of stage fright, you know, he was got a little bit nervous, you know, as he's, you know, starting it out, he gets the motherboard installed. Good. Everything's going great. Comes to time for the chip install, grabs the microchip. And as he was coming across to put it in, he didn't use the chip extractor. He dropped it underneath this chip. There are hundreds of little gold, uh, I guess. Uh, pins sticking out from the bottom of this microchip they're smaller than the size of a human hair and so as he's coming he drops it and it hits the edge of the computer and goes off and bends about 40 of these pins we now had to spend i luckily had a precision kit at my house and i live close to the university so i'd run back to my house get my magnifying glass and my precision kit and then me and the instructor sat there for well over an hour trying to bend all of these little pins back into place so that they could fit back into the computer. Otherwise we were out 500 bucks. So without wanting to use a 50 cent tool and taking the time, we almost lost out on $500, a $500 processor. And trust me, that's a relatively inexpensive processor, especially if you're getting an enterprise level, they can get really costly, really quick and just, taking the time to use that tool could have saved all of those problems. And Kelly, he, all of this wasn't on one desk either. He's, he was walking with it as well, right? So if it was like, it would have been easier if it was all laid out in one centralized place. Well, too. no, we were we were crowded around him. He was going from, he was just pulling it out of the box that it came in. Okay, great, okay. And then okay. just setting it okay. in. So it was, this was in one work area. And yes, it was. So yeah, CPU. it was the CPU that he dropped so yeah that's a cautionary tale don't don't lose out on a lot of money just because not wanting to get a 50 cent tool so all right i'm done i think that was it with the tools uh it has a lot of different things in there we go to the next slide yeah all right we have a post-diagnostic card and as it stands, anybody ever turn a computer on and hear a series of beeps? Those beeps actually have some significance. If the computer doesn't continue to turn all the way on, if it turns all the way on, you're good. But if it stops and you hear these beeps, depending on the manufacturer of the, of the PC, because unfortunately there's not a universal beep code which is kind of lame but it should have been that so um you can record those beats two beat two short beats one long beat in google for a dell xyz and that will say it will let you know hey that means x is happening to your pc or y is happening that, that means your memory somehow your memory um chip has become uh slightly dislodged or ineffective so that's a tool in our tool bag to realize what could be going on with that PC. Along with that, you have these diagnostic cards. These cards can be used to also identify what's not happening or what's happening during the process of that PC starting up as well. Just an added tool. Is it something that you'll see in the industry a lot, depending on your position? But um, there's other ways sometimes to get around the need of these, but to have it is always a cool thing to have. Do I have one? No. Kelly, do you have a, a postcard? 
Uh, no, I, that's not one, not something I've acquired. I mean, there, I mean, you could probably pick one up for between 20 and $50, right? but a lot of times you're just hearing, it's like, okay, it was three short beeps. Look it up, you know, like, oh, all right, I have a, you know, a Tomahawk motherboard, whatever, motherboard. what do those yeah. beeps mean? And then it will, it will tell you, uh, based off that manufacturer, those three beeps mean your, your RAM modules aren't seated properly, you know, so you just listen out for it and then you can go and look it up real quick based off the manufacturer of the motherboard and be able to determine, you know, what you need to check at that point. Although oftentimes you've opened up that computer with a specific purpose, like you've changed out a component right. and it may just mean that you haven't seated that component properly, or maybe you forgot to hook up one of the wires as you were closing it up, something along those lines. It's usually something pretty simple. It's meant to be a quick reference for very basic, um, issues i like it we can go to that next slide kelly these are going to be some networking tools uh crimper cable stripper multimeter tone generator probe cable tester loopback plug we'll talk about as well wi-fi analyzer and a punch down tool so some it's um purposely called networking tools but some of these can be used in other places besides networking Let's talk about the tone generator and a probe. Anybody wants to uh, at least speak on what you think that is for or what, what uses that can be beneficial in? Engage me, engage me. Come on, guys and gals. What do you think we're using this tone generator and probe for? Just come is off it me. For, are Go ahead, Ms. Lewis. Um, when you stated it, when you were talking about the beeping noises, um, when you turn the computer on, is it measuring the sounds or when it's, when it's running? That's I, I, I see where you're trying to go with it. That's not it, but I like where your mind is going with it. Come on, Pozo, what you got for me? Uh, a, tone generator, a tone generator sends a tone through one end of the cable in order to let us know and detect the same tone at the other side of the cable that could be across the wall. I like it. What I want to do, and I see your hands up there, we're going to let you answer some of the other ones. So I worked at the cable company for a little while. I had my own truck, my kit. You know, I would have to go out and turn you off, turn you on, whatever the case may be. So one of the tools that I was getting, that I received in that kit was a tone generator and a, a pro. What's really neat is that if you work, if you stayed in an apartment complex, a lot of those cables have a very centralized junction box. And I can identify which cable belongs to you if I put my tone generator on the cable inside your home. And then I had my probe up under the apartment trying to touch that cable. Once I touch that cable, I hear a beep. That will let me know where one end is and where the other end is located amongst a whole bunch of cables. So it's the ability to identify a cable in a, um, a sea of cables by sending a signal, a tone through that cable, the cable that you want to identify. So this can work either in the setting, like I just said, in a cable setting, or if you're in a networking closet and you've identified a, a cable on one end that you wanna see, where is this cable? Cause I have like 25 cables here and I don't know which one it is. Also known as Fox and Hound, thank you, Kelly. But it's a very easy way to send a sound through a cable so you can easily Fox identify it amongst others. So that's my tone generator and probe. Um, cable tester. Alan, go for it. What's the cable tester, sir? What do you think a cable tester can be? Uh, something to just make sure the cable is uh, viable and uh, ready to use. Okay. So in in at home, for personal use, you just go to Walmart or whatever big box store or even online, and you buy a cable that's already put together. Mm -hmm. It has, has ends on it. It's ready to go out the box. 99% of the time, you're not having any issues with that cable. In an enterprise setting, 
or in certain organizations, they may buy a spool of cable on one of those big round wheels and they cut the cable to length. So they don't have more than they need or they have just enough because those already pre-cut cables may not be long enough. And you want one long, or you want one cable. You don't want it to have breaks in it if you can avoid that. So it's a process, which you guys will learn how to create that cable, what colors go where, because everything has a place and a purpose. What if you aren't getting connectivity and you're like, uh, why can I get on the internet or why can I connect to a network? That cable could be bad. And a cable tester will let you know by doing a series of um, a test. I wish I had another word for you, but um, to identify if this cable is bad. And it can be bad because you crossed over some of the, the strands of cabling inside of the cable. And that will cause that cable not to work or not to work effectively. So that's what your cable tester will do for you. Um, well, we got another one. Loop back plug. This is one that you will have to know what it is to know what it is. But anybody know what a loop back plug is or what it's used for? Not after you Google. Don't be Googling. What you got for me, Chris? Is that is that to test your network, like seeing if you're dropping packets or something like that? A loop back. I like where you are with it. Uh, close. Chris. Yeah, it, it's a it's the ability to identify if your if your um, NIC card is working properly, if that's not your issue. So basically you take a computer, you plug in this, Kelly has one. Do you have one close, Kelly? If you don't have a close, don't worry about it. I but do, yeah, I just gotta grab my toolbox, my toolbox oh, behind me. Give me one second. Okay, okay. While Kelly's doing that, I'm gonna talk about it. It's, it, it's a small little uh, device with the ethernet tip on it that goes into, the, into your NIC of your your computer and it can serve serve as a way to identify if your your computer is having an issue with its net card and if it is we can address it that way but if it's not it'll let you know if that card is viable and that's a quick way to uh identify what that that um if you're dealing with that device net card or if you having a networking issue so many different ways that we address problems you want to do the easiest way first so kelly's showing it's very small all it is it is all it is a little cable with that with like i said with the rj45 on the end it's called a loop back plug and that's also uh, a number that refers to that as well we could do this with hardware we can do it with software so that's neat um and the only purpose of it is to make sure your NIC, your network interface card is functioning. That's the yeah. sole purpose of it. So you plug it in, if you're getting lights, you're good. And then you unplug it and you're good to go. We have cable crimper, cable stripper, punch down to, let's talk about those in kind of conjunction. We know crimper and stripper, all that's being used in that yellow device at the top of your screen to help create that cable. We talked about creating a, a actual um custom cable to a certain length so you gotta you gotta crimp it you gotta expose the wire and line everything up and then we'll strip the wire then you can crimp it to the the end that you want to use which is the rj45 or if you got a phone line that you're making which i don't know if we'll be doing that uh not likely to be doing that um uh, but rj11 so it helps you create those um those cables Punch down to so in a server closet, networking closet. There's a they call it a, a rack. We have a we have certain racks that they use. So the punch down to is actually a way to put those those cables into those racks at at the angle. It has a little. It's kind of neat because you push it. And it, it actually pushes the cable in and locks it into place. It's simple as that. It's, pu it's punching it down into the device so it stays where it needs to stay. Uh, cutting off enough of the cable, the uh, plastic portion of it to expose the wire. Wi-Fi analyzer. 
Who's gonna Who's gonna go for it? Is that? Oh, I'm gonna just I'm gonna just take a stab stab in the dark just off of the name. <laughs> okay. That analyzes the Wi-Fi. Oh, Re it's Re uh, Renee, you can't do that. You can't just turn the I'm definition around. If but, I was yeah. going, listen, but test like the range and how Wi-Fi capable. Am I am I you're dancing right. around? It's, the, you're right. The, it's the right pretty much that, but uh, the other back plug it violin. loops the plug back into itself. It's a loop back plug. <laughs> yeah, loop Thank back you, plug. Kelly. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Ergo, loop back plug. But yes, a Wi-Fi analyzer is the ability to check for a connection, even if it's not being broadcasted. Like if I come to uh, Mark's house, Mark may have uh, internet in his house, but when I come in, I can't find his. I can't find it on my phone. It's not popping up. He may have made. It, he may have turned off the broadcast, which you can do. But a Wi-Fi analyzer will let me know that it exists there, and I just have to, you know, nudge Mark for the information so I can get onto his network. Maybe I have to type in the name. A lot of times when you go to places, you'll see. Walmart Wi-Fi free. What if Walmart didn't want you to identify that they had it and you had to type that into the name, the SSID? So that's what an analyzer will also allow you to do. Uh, I think, Kelly, you answered, Miss uh, Ash, a lot of these definitions are within your, your readings. Yeah, in, and, in the uh, readings, they'll have pictures of all the tools, what they're used for and stuff like that to kind of break it down for you. So they're, they're, it is there. Yeah, it's available for you. But I just wanted to get some more engagement out of you. But it's these are just tools of the uh, industry, and you'll get. Oh, I didn't talk about multimeter. Multimeter can be used in a lot of different ways. You want to know if, as what, how much wattage or volts are going through certain the certain parts of the or powered devices, or if even if it's any power is going through it. So it's a very general tool that can be used in a lot of different ways. And if you notice there's a dial on it, you can set it for different um, ranges that you're looking for the, uh, that those settings, those power settings. Uh, did I you talk about the punch down tool real quick? I did, but go for it, Kelly, because All I don't right, know. I mean, it's, I don't it, feel... it's kind of a multi-tool. Um, if you look at the tip of it, it, it it's like, a, like two prongs on it. One will have like a little flat piece. The other piece, the other side of it, will actually have a little blade on it. Um, and this is how you would set up the receptacles inside the wall and on punch down blocks in server rooms and stuff like that. How you would push those little cables down in, and it cuts off the other end of them so that it's nice and neat and clean. Um, but every single one of these, you have to use the punch down tool to actually set it. So in the walls you would use a punch down tool for cables, you would use a crimper. Yeah. Um, and then the cables in the walls, for quick reference, they call them horizontal runs, um, which would be from your receptacle in the wall where you would plug in your computer that would run all the way to the switch in the server room, wherever it is. So questions so far on that. All right. <laughs> I don't think we have this Kahoot set up, so I, I don't either. Yeah, but yeah. we will. We will have Kahoots probably tomorrow and other days as well. Yeah, they're coming. Um, some Anybody of you use may Kahoot? come to love it. Some of you may come to hate it. Okay. Uh, but it is a game. Uh, used for learning where you will compete say, with your game, classmates. Is there a login or something for it? You have a, a application that you can download for your mobile device or you can do it on your desktop. But it's, uh, yeah, a lot of people, it's a lot of school age people will use it. But basically, yeah, just, and they're just going to keep coming, man. Just lock this. I'm running lock, out of posting. Lock, lock in. You're running out of posting. 
<laughs> but it's well, a, way a lot of them. Like, if we're gonna do a Kahoot, we always drop the Kahoot link in the chat before we'll do it. And then um, each game, as you start them up, has their own pin that you would put in, and then you put the yeah. pin in, and you would join all your classmates um, to compete. But yeah, I would definitely say if you have a, uh, a smartphone, go ahead and download the Kahoot app on your smartphone. It is free. Yeah. Um, or if you want to do it on your computer, if you have dual screen, it works out really well. Otherwise, you're going to have to, you know, manage your window size because the questions will come up on our shared screen, but your answers will be on your screen. Your, um, you'll all you'll see is like square, triangle, circle, circle. Well, I don't remember what the other one is, you know. But uh, when I first played it, it, you know, like I had never heard of Kahoot. My wife mentioned it briefly that she uses it in her classrooms and stuff like that, but I'd never used it, never seen it, never been exposed to it. There was no instruction given in our class. And then we get it up and, I'm, you know, he puts it up and I'm staring solely at my monitoring. He's like, all right, we're going to be playing Kahoot. So turns it on, gets going. All I see is like circle, square, whatever, triangle on my computer. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, is this one of those psychological tests where you see which shapes you're gravitating towards or something like that? I didn't know what it was. So I just sit there and I just randomly pick a, a shape i'm like okay well I, I guess i'm feeling very triangle like today so i'll go with that one and i went ahead and clicked on it and i got the answer wrong and then all of a sudden i look up at the projector in the front of the class and see that the actual question and answers were up there so nobody had actually explained it to me and never been exposed to it so it was you know it was a learning moment <laughs> for me you get to see how quick your thumbs are and we also like i tell you is is there's a method to our madness the whole purpose of Kahoot for us is to get you comfortable with answering questions correctly, quickly, because that test that you'll take is timed and we don't want you to spend too much time on it. So this is another way and it's fun to see who's who's been studying and who, you know, who's battling yeah. it out to get on the podium. So it's a, 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 and a great way to stay engaged with you guys especially towards the end of the class where you guys all know the answers and it becomes just a race against time. Yeah. And one miss punch, like you miss click one time, you'll go from first place to like 12th place because yeah. everybody is like within a few, you know, milliseconds of each other fighting for the top spots. So it's a lot of fun. It kind of helps reinforce it and just, you know, kind of makes it a little more entertaining. But are there any questions so far as to what we've gone over today, just with this particular technical session? All right, we should kind of have a basic understanding as to the differences between hardware, software, and firmware. Uh, not a real deep knowledge yet. We're still kind of cruising at about 10,000 feet, just giving some basic examples. We should know what inputs and outputs are, what examples of those are, processing units of the computer. Um, we should be able to understand basic safety precautions when dealing with electricity, the various types of fire extinguishers that we would, you know, come across on a day-to-day -day basis and what they would be used for, as well as general tools of the trade that you would be using when working on computers. So this is just kind of a light introduction, kind of starting to dive into some of that knowledge. So, all right, go ahead and stop the recording here.